How much of AI right now is innovation in theater? What's real and what's hype? Large language models and AI are a crazy advantage. That is not theater. Take a very simple example, efficiency and allocation, resource allocation. Is AI finally going to break in in things like healthcare? On healthcare, I think we power between 13 and 14% of all hospital bed allocation in the country. Wow. And Palantir is ideal for that. You said recently, Alex, that some tech leaders are calling for an AI pause because they don't have a product ready. Uh, how much of AI right now is innovation in theater? What's real and what's hype? What should we be paying attention to? Well, the, the big thing that we have to avoid in, in, in our country, but, but there's less of a problem for us than in other countries, is there's a, just an attempt to dampen AI and its utilization by people who don't have a product. And that is like, this is actually a big deal inside and outside of government. Now, luckily for us in this country, it's a much smaller deal than say in Europe, where it's like, you know, there's all these discussions, some of which I very much support and some of which we can power. How, where does the data go? How does it used? Where does it flow? What is in the algorithm? Is the algorithm discriminatory? Mm -hmm. But some of it is you'd say in German, Vorgeschoben, which means kind of just put out there in, as a theatrical thing because there aren't really that many. There are some uh, companies providing uh, AI in the form of advanced machine learning or large language models. Um, the, we, we have a slight bias here at Palantir. We build a software that will allow you to process large language models, rebuild the output of large language models, turn it into what we call an agent, which is a safe algorithm you can run across your enterprise, and we can interact back and forth with large language models or, or other forms of AI so that the, the algorithm of large man, Mars Mail understands your enterprise, but you don't outsource the knowledge of your enterprise to the large language model. So I, I believe that that will be the future and that these things implemented correctly, large language models and AI are a crazy advantage over people who don't. And you could just take very simple examples on margins and business, efficiency and allocation, being able, resource allocation, um, uh, rebuilding your enterprise so that you get the most efficient parts at the right time, um, allocation of assets, resources, um, figuring out, by the way, one of the most important uses of AI for America that we're just beginning to see, which we're seeing at a, a, a company I won't mention, just because I haven't, but like manufacturing, often manufacturing has a cultural element. So. If you want to manufacture something in America like is manufactured in Japan or Taiwan, that's actually a really hard thing to do. But one of the things uh, uh, algorithms and AI will allow you to do is control the instruments, control production so that you get an American workforce, the advantages of being in the US and production like you exactly like you would have in Japan mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. Taiwan or other places. And so that is not theater. That is, and, and by the way, the part that's definitely not theory is you're going to watch the GDP of America compared to the world. This is what I also wanted to ask you about because it, it does seem to me like we, it could affect productivity, right? Which is the input to GDP. And in America, productivity and things like healthcare, education, even areas if we disagree on politics, we can both agree those are very important to work better for our country. Like productivity is stagnated in those areas for decades. Is AI finally going to break in and, and maybe help productivity there? Are we going to well, be able to fix some things? We have a lot of our. We had no uh, clients in in. Edu we'll leave education. That's we're not heavily involved in that. But um, on healthcare, pharmaceuticals, uh, hospital care, we had basically very few clients last year. And now I think we power allocation at fifteen t between thirteen and fourteen percent of all hospital bed allocation in the country. Wow. We have, um, and it's simply because um, the people in these industries know that they need instruments to increase efficiency and productivity. Part of the reason why it was hard to do this is the use case they have is very difficult because you have to increase productivity with low margins under harsh conditions, meaning you will, mm -hmm. you can get sued, you do get sued. There are hip, there are privacy protections that are the most sacrosanct in the world. Uh, there are issues around uh, resource allocation that involve class and race. Uh, which uh, which mean that I don't want to touch those. So those are those are issues. Those are issues that uh, that the where you would you need to be able to track what goes into the algorithm, how the algorithm is used, uh, and how that algorithm then leads back to efficiency without be getting into hot water either morally, institutionally, or legally. 
the Palantir is ideal for that. Yeah. And so, but again, it's precisely because one of the most amazing things in business is no one believes that we're, you know, that Palantir's deep understanding of uh, the technical issues that involve data protection, civil liberties, are things that generated our product. Yes, but if you're dealing with this use case, there's only one engine you can use because we've spent 20 years thinking and building products for this. And, and interestingly, it's the kind of things you use to identify adversaries with software mm -hmm. uh, also presuppose uh, um, a, a data protection, civil liberties bias. It's not just find enemy, it's yeah. find enemy, is this the stupid general we want to keep alive or is this the general <laughs> that's smart?